Hello everyone, good morning from the Pawlecki Ranch. Welcome to our webinar today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Simmonsma. I'm the Technical Services Manager for the Ecke Ranch. And I also have with me my coworker and fellow tech support person, Jack Williams. Hi everyone, this is Jack. I am, I'm in California, but I was in a lot of your greenhouses last week. So uh, I'm glad to have you with us today on the webinar. All right, thanks Jack. Well, today's webinar is sponsored by Ecke Ranch and our friends at JBK. And we're happy to bring to you information about Sun Patients, the Sun Patients program and culture. And then we're also going to talk with you about an ultra geranium concept that will be offered by JBK. Uh, before we get started, I want to cover a quick housekeeping item. Uh, there are several people on the call today, and so we can hear you, but you can't hear us. That doesn't mean that we don't want you to feel free to ask as many questions as possible. Um, you can use the toolbar to the right hand side of your screen to post questions. We do have you on the call for an hour today and we'll try to be respectful of your time. Uh, you know, if we don't have time to answer as many questions that come in, we will address those questions via email after the session. Today's webinar is also recorded and it will be available at ecchi.com on On Media, which is Ecchi's TV station. So, um, especially like on the Sun Patients culture part when there's a lot of information offered, don't feel like you have to scramble to take notes because the information will be available, um, including the audio and the questions that were asked on ecchi.com and that's usually available about 24 hours after the session. Okay, with that we're going to go ahead and get started and I'm going to turn it over to Jack and he's going to walk us through some Sun Patients highlights and a program overview. Okay, well Again, thank you everyone for joining us today. Actually, this is a perfect time to talk about the Sun Patients. As I indicated, I was visiting growers in, uh, in Quebec and then on into the Maritimes last week. And of course, most of you are getting your orders put together and, and ready for the next season. Sun Patients was one of the biggest topics that we discussed as we were going through. Yeah, we saw some of those poinsettias, but we also talked a lot about these other crops. Um, so let's talk about the highlights on this program just to kind of reinforce as you're really putting your program together for the next year. For those of you who are going to be rooting the cuttings, this is really quite an incredible plant. One of those features is that it roots in two weeks versus four weeks. Now, two weeks you have good root system. By three weeks you're transplanting. Um, they are that aggressive. They are that fast. So as we look at these and think about, you know, the impact of that, we'll talk more later on that, is they are going to root fast, so you have to be prepared to move fast with them. One of the biggest problems that can come up in your crop is if you don't get them transplanted and give them enough space on an ongoing basis, then you're going to have problems of stretch, which will also disrupt the architecture of the plant. So really plan that you're either in bigger cells or you're ready to move and get them spaced out as quickly as possible. This is a crop, because of its vigor, it will um, grow faster, so it's going to use less energy. Um, that's going to free up your greenhouse space a little bit faster. What we do love about the Sun Patient is it's is not like the New Guineas in that this can be grown cooler. This can be grown with just about everything else in your greenhouse. As we've referenced here, geraniums, uh, good temperature range to be looking at. And so it gives you the ability to mainstream this into your greenhouse and not be having to give it such specialized conditions in order to be successful. When we talk about the plant as it leaves your greenhouse and goes out uh, to the consumers through the retail, this is a plant that will take full sun conditions. Now, in some parts of Canada, of course, there you know there are areas where New Guineas can take it in full sun, although those areas you have to really be mindful of how much water it takes to do that. These will do great in full sun. They're going to take the conditions throughout Canada for that. Um, excellent vigor. They're going to grow to be nice and large and full and really give a spectacular show. We call it three season performance because it's going to go in starting spring, run all the way through autumn, um, hard frost. And last week I actually saw plants that had just, you know, been hit by enough frost that they had to be taken out. So again, a lot of flower power, a lot of show, a lot of value out of this, this crop. So when we look at the product offering, there are, there are three uh, lines, but we're going to really focus in today on the ones that we think are the, the most important for the growers that, that are looking at orders right now. The spreading varieties, there are two of them, the spreading salmon and the spreading white. And the keynote of both of these is, as the name indicates, they have a broader, wider architecture, so they're really spreading in their habit. Um, makes them fantastic for hanging baskets. 
Uh, they're big, showy. If they are planted in the ground and used in a landscape capacity, they do still get large and um, grow to the height, similar to what the compacts will do. Um, these do feature a very strongly variegated leaf. So as you see in the pictures there, uh, both the salmon and the white have a very kind of yellowish center of the leaf with a green margin. Uh, makes for a very striking contrast of the flowers against the foliage. And again, really good for landscape, really good for hanging baskets. Here it shows you a picture of a, a spreading salmon in the pot, so it gives you a little bit of a feel for, again, how it kind of fills out. It goes broader and wider. It's a really good view of what the plant looks like, and so, again, um, the architecture that to really get the best results will continually harp about you've got to give it space in order to prevent any issues. Uh, the picture on the right shows it in the landscape, so it gives you an idea that the plants, again, have that ability to really fill in uh, make a nice show. This happens to be down at the Dallas Arboretum. These plants have been tested and shown very successful in these high heat, high full sunlight conditions. Um, Dallas Arboretum is certainly a big fan of this plant, and you guys will be too. In the compact variety, this is the one that's probably going to be the most versatile for your use uh, through pots, baskets, and we'll talk about mixed containers as well as we go through today. Um, the widest color range is available here, and as you see from the listing in the pictures, we go from you know the whites and the, the pastel pinks through some of the mid colors, the deep rose, the coral, and then into the darker, the magenta, the orange. So unlike New Guinea's, we don't yet have such a huge range of colors, but all the basic colors that are so necessary for a program are here. Admittedly, uh, we are missing a red. The braiders know that, and they're working on that, and hopefully we'll bring a red forward to the market within the next couple years. But to start off, a nice color range to work with that will work into just about any program. Uh, we show this picture. The, the young lady in the, in the photo is Jenny Bewley. She runs our uh, Georgia heat trials in the area right around Athens, Georgia. Here she's standing next to the compact blush pink, in the um, public gardens there at the University of Georgia. So you can see that uh, these plants get up to a pretty good height. Now, Jenny's a pretty tall gal, so you know it gives a good reference from a size standpoint of, of how big the plants can achieve in the garden. So don't be concerned. Growers have mentioned to us that you know they're worried that from the original vigorous varieties, which are known for their height and size in the garden, that the compact types would be too compact and not the value of the others. The reality is that these compacts are almost as tall as the vigorous when they get into the garden and then grow, so you don't have to worry about the consumers being disappointed in the performance. The benefit to you, the grower, is the compact types are going to be more manageable from a crop standpoint. They're going to create better looking pots. There'll be less stretch and openness um, in the plant itself. And so it's, again, a, a little bit more refined, better genetics for your use in the, in the greenhouse, getting ready to go out to to the retail. Here's a good picture of the compact coral. Once again, in Athens, Georgia, in a, this is a nice like 14-inch um, tub. There we have to paint them white because the heat is so intense that if we don't, that we'll cook the root systems of anything that's exposed. Uh, and again, this picture would be taken in full sun conditions about mid-August. So it gives you kind of a reference point again, of what the look of this plant is and what you can expect from a garden performance, both in the container or from the previous shot, what it looked like in the soil. We think that the Sun Patients are, you know, an ideal crop, especially for use in mixed containers. Pictures you're looking at here came from our pack trials this past um, spring. And what you're looking at is the large baskets, the orange and the, the lavender on top, those are a basket with three cuttings per pot. That's a very traditional basket. What you're looking at um, with the mixtures in them, you're looking at one cutting, and then you're looking at the additional components in there. So the center one is the, the orange with lamium planted in it. The one to the right is going to be the orange with the copa. One of the great opportunities here is the plant is bigger and vigorous enough that using one cutting is going to allow you to create a nice full shape. And so to make it into a combination basket in these 12-inch baskets, it's easy to add a couple other things. You've got a higher value product going out to the retail, and you still are able to do it. 
quite different than what would be done with a New Guinea, where it would take three to four cuttings in a basket to really execute just the, the impatience part of it, let alone the components. Um, this past season, uh, if you went to see the trials at the Savoia uh, Research Gardens there in uh, Ontario, you would probably have seen one of these combination planters. Mal had asked us to provide some recipes and, and the material to, to create mixed containers. Here you see the um, compact blush pink put together with the Selenia, Dusty Rose, and then the Papillion Pink um, Gara. What we love about this, again, the opportunity to use some patients in mixed containers as well as single containers. It's vigorous enough to really keep up with other plant material. Uh, again, it takes less plant material to achieve this kind of look in a container. And so we have a couple examples here because we just think this is a, an excellent usage for the product, uh, especially where there's such a, a strong desire to produce more mixed containers for the market. Here you see the spreading variety, spreading salmon. Together we've used the stardom geranium, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, in addition, there's some coleus in there. And again, these are plants that really blend together nicely and give us a really good just kind of shape and form. And again, multi-season performance. Okay. At this point, yeah. Any questions from the group that have come in or that we can take at this point we can address before we move on to culture? Um, actually, it doesn't look like we've had any come in about the product offering. That doesn't mean that if you come up with, you know, if you have a question about variety selection or product offering later, um, after we've covered the culture section, you can just jump in and let us know. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start to talk about culture now. And we just really feel that it's important that growers understand the culture of sun patients and plan accordingly to have space in your greenhouse, have, you know, thoughts about what, you know, what the culture should be like, and, you know, plan ahead in terms of growth regulators and space and all of those things, um, you know, so that when the, when the crop is in your greenhouse, you're ready to go and any questions that you might have had you know, have been answered prior to. This is kind of a crop where we'll talk a lot about stretch um, and how quickly they can stretch in propagation and in the finishing environment and how branching and architecture and flower power and all of those things are really adversely affected if the plants stretch. And so, and it's really hard to correct for stretch at that point. So we really want you to be thinking ahead about how these are going to fit into your program. I'm going to talk a little bit about propagation first before we move into finishing. Uh, Jack's already talked a little bit about some of the major differences between a regular New Guinea patient and the Sun patient, uh, but I'll cover some program highlights quickly. Um, they do have a shorter production schedule than a New Guinea patient. They perform, perform best under higher light and warmer temperatures in the greenhouse and in the garden environment. They do need to be spaced early and on time, um, you know, and we'll keep driving that message home today that space, you know, they do need adequate space. This isn't a crop where we'd want to try to cut corners, um, you know, and have them at tighter spacing. And it really is important to have it, you know, planned in your program and the greenhouse space plan so that you can space on time. They do have great performance in full sun in the landscape, and their great vigor equals less plants needed to fill out in the landscape and in containers. Jack also talked about how you can do one plant per pot in, you know, your hanging baskets versus three plants per pot. So it does give the grower the opportunity, especially to think about the economics of that pot, how many cuttings they're going to have in there, um, you know, and really reduce your initial input costs. So we'll talk about propagation first. Uh, we do recommend direct sticking the sun patients, especially like in your quartz and six inch and maybe even your eight inch hanging baskets, um, just because the the chance for them to stretch is a lot less if they're direct stuck. However, they can be propagated in traditional liners. Uh, Jack had already mentioned this, but you know we do recommend nothing uh, smaller than a 72 cell. And in fact, if you can put them in like a 50 millimeter alley or something like that, all the better. The more you know soil volume there is there, and the more space around those cuttings, the less chance there's going to be that you'll get stretch. Uh, propagation cycle is two to three weeks, and generally two weeks is enough. Uh, they do have a very vigorous root system, and if that root system really starts to circle the cell, and then you go on to transplant, it's actually going to slow things up a little bit, just because it takes those roots a while to break out of that cycle. Um, you know, so be ready to transplant these on time from the propagation environment. No rooting hormone is nece necessary. They root very quickly and evenly without rooting hormone. Uh, light levels in propagation should start at 2,000 foot candles and then increase to 3,000 foot candles by day 10. So it's a bright environment in propagation. 
Uh, soil temps, as always, you know, warm soil temperatures and bottom heat do enhance rooting and speed uni and increase uniformity to rooting. In terms of misting, we really want to avoid over misting. And in general, you know, it's been our experience and most of the growers that we, you know, have watched with have some patients in their greenhouses that you can have them off the mist by day seven. And generally, night misting is not uh, necessary even from the very beginning. Now, of course, this is going to vary depending on individual greenhouse environments and, you know, temperatures and light levels that time of year, how much you have to miss. But the, the quicker you can get them off the mist, the better. Uh, they're really going to start to stretch quickly uh, with all that moisture availability. Growth regulating uh, in propagation is recommended. We've done quite a bit of growth regulating studies on the sun patients and have found that the growth regulating and propagation not only prevents stretch in the propagation environment and helps prevent stretch in the finishing environment, but it does enhance branching. Um, because we're just talking about the spreading and the compact series today, I'll just talk about the applications for those types. Um, for the spreading series, we do recommend a tank mix of B9, 2,500 parts per million, and Bonsai, 10 parts per million. Again, that's a tank mix of those two chemicals applied as a spray at day 10 to runoff. And it's been our experience that the B9 kind of gives you the same uh, type of branching and enhanced branching that you would get from like a Florel application. You can't use Florel on sun patients, which I'll point out a little bit later, but you do get some branching effects from that B9 and then the Bonsai helps reduce stretch. And, you know, we found with the spray to runoff, you know, getting some uptake through the stem, you know, just gives you some better control and some more residual activity. It's important with all your growth regulator applications to make sure that you have even soil moisture at the time of the application, just because that's going to um, increase your consistency that you get from the concentra concentration of that spray. For the compact series, we also recommend a tank mix of the B9 Bonsai, but you can see that we've reduced the, B the Bonsai rate to five parts per million and still 2,500 parts per million on the B9, that application is applied at day 21. Um, you know, so about a week and a half later than you would with the spreading series. So, you know, depending on if you're direct sticking or if you are propping in traditional cells, likely that application is going to come after propagation because it's, a th it's three full weeks after stick. But it is, you know, you can certainly try the sun patients without the growth regulating in propagation. It's just been our experience that, you know, we get more a uniform crop, less stretch, uh, better branching, and better flower power with these applications. And as I said before, do not use Florel on sun patients. It will delay flowering and stunt growth. Just some tips in propagation. Transplant on time for best performance. As I said, those root systems are very vigorous and they'll start to circle those cells quickly. And, you know, once you get some tissue expansion and you get those uh, roots starting to circle those cells, they're going to start to stretch very quickly. They will stretch if they're held over. And, uh, you know, stretch just doesn't result in, in bigger cuttings. It's really going to reduce branching and, um, you know, affect the quality of the crop all the way to finish if you allow those cuttings to stretch because there's not a great way to correct for it. The, and as I said, again, they do have the vigorous root system, so really watch those when those roots are starting to push out and they're at the edge of the cells. It's time to transplant. Uh, this is a good shot here that was taken when we were doing our growth regular, regulator studies of the different um, applications with the B9 uh, bonsai tank mix, or yeah, the B9 bonsai tank mix, as you can see the cutting to the left here was not growth regulated. Um, we don't see a whole lot of stretch now, though it does look a little bit softer and stretched, but left much longer and this cutting would have stretched very quickly. The cuttings to the right with the different type treatments are, you know, nicely toned. The inner nodes are nicely stacked and these cuttings are ready to be transplanted. <clears throat> Do I have any questions about the propagation environment before we move on? Jack, do you have anything additional to add? Yeah, I, I would go back to where you were talking about the, the growth regulators. Um, if you are going to try to do these without growth regulators, I'd really suggest that we're only then talking about a direct st stick situation where you have enough space around each and every cutting that the risk of stretch just isn't there. If you are going to be propagating in cells, no matter you know what that cell configuration is, you know, again, our experience really clearly shows that you need to go ahead with those growth regulators. The other comment is, again, we recognize that you all are in Canada, so that um, the first question always comes up is, are those growth regulator recommendations appropriate to our region? You know, if you feel like that the bonsai rate is too high, you know, you can bring some of those down. As you saw from the 
the cuttings that were shown over there, they got pretty similar results with different quantities or, or concentrations within the use of B9 and bonsai. So you could, in most cases, probably, you know, just stay at that five part per million and be okay. Um, the key is, again, be sure to get it on within the date ranges that we've brought out. And, again, if you're not going to use those growth regulators, try to limit that to any of your direct stick only type programs. Okay, thanks Jack. All right, with that we're going to move on to finishing and uh, talk about scheduling and you know different things that you may encounter in the finishing environment. Um, we'll just talk about some crop specifics here and some basic information. In terms of pH 5.8 to 6.2, uh, one of the messages that you'll hear Jack and I both convey today is that it can be grown very successfully with geraniums um, in terms of temperatures and light requirements, even nutritional requirements, um, and pH right there in line with what, a geranium, what we'd like to see a zonal geranium crop at. Uh, in terms of water requirements, um, you want to avoid excess irrigation while the plants are establishing. And then once established, you'd want to keep the soil evenly moist. Uh, leaf scorch may occur if the plants are allowed to dry too much, especially if relative humidity is low. Um, we just finished a very promising water restriction trial at the ranch uh, where we used water restriction instead of growth regulating in the finishing environment, um, you know, to try to keep leaf size down but still get maximum flower power. And, uh, you know, what we really found was that Propagating under a traditional propagation environment with the same mist and the same, you know, all of, the, you know, the same type of propagation environment that you would provide for most crops and avoid over misting is best. Uh, once you get them transplanted, still keep that soil evenly moist, but then water restriction after the plants were um, established and actually allowing, you know, maybe one or two plants to flag is kind of your indicator that it's time to water was really a good way to keep soil or to keep the leaf size down and to avoid having to use a growth regulator application in the finishing environment. So, um, In terms of fertility, we recommend 200 parts per million nitrogen using a nitrate-based nitrogen. Uh, the, excess ammoniacal, or the excess phosphorus in an ammoniacal nitrogen will promote too much vegetative growth, so stay away from like your 2010-20s or your 2020-20s just because you're going to get too much soft growth there. We like to keep this EC below 2.0. Um, it is important to note, though, that some patients don't seem to be as sensitive to high EC um, and high fertility rates as a New Guinean patient crop would. So where you start to get, start to see that leathery, dark green growth like you do on a New Guinea crop, uh, we don't really see that on some patients. So that makes it a little bit more uh, grower friendly in, in the uh, finishing environment. Temperature ranges, uh, we like to see them established warm as always. That's going to be best for good root establishment and to get that shoot growth off and started. Uh, once they're established, they are uh, adaptable to a wide range of conditions. Uh, you can see day temps anywhere from 65 to 85, and night temps from uh, 60 to 68 degrees. So that's a pretty wide range of temperatures. Um, they can be finished cooler than a regular New Guinean patient crop. And the example I like to use is that um, if you take a New Guinean patient crop and you have like 60 degree nights and 65 degree days, that's an ADT of only about 62 degrees. And on most uh, New Guinea and patient genetics that are out there, that would delay flowering for, you know, anywhere from 30 to 45 days. And, you know, while you certainly, if you wanted to grow the sun patients that cool, it may slow the flowering up by a few days, but it's certainly not going to delay things by a month or a month and a half the way that it would with a New Guinea and patient crop. Uh, light levels, they should be acclimated to 3,000 coming out of the propagation environment. And then once established, we like to see those light levels at 5,000 plus. Um, it's really important to keep those light levels nice and bright in the greenhouse and avoid hanging baskets overhead. We don't want those plants competing for light, you know, it, whether it's space between their neighboring plant or hanging baskets overhead because that's really going to be conducive to stretch. Finishing under low light levels will also reduce the flower count. Uh, sun patients can be finished outdoors, but as long as it's warm enough, you know, we get a lot of questions from growers about, you know, sending these outdoors to finish growing outdoors, and if the nighttime temperatures aren't at least in the upper 50s when you send those plants out the door, which is probably not going to be applicable to you guys in Canada real early in the spring anyway, but they're not going to grow at that, you know, those type of temperatures are just going to sit there and probably not put on a lot of vegetative growth until temperatures warm up. So they can be finished outdoors as long as nighttime temperatures are warm, but it's important that they be acclimated to 5,000 foot candles of light before they go out. 
We do not recommend pinching on sun patients. Um, it you know, would be kind of the first thought to correct for a stretch type situation, but it will delay flowering and it really changes the architecture of the plant. There's certain colors in there that really just sort of flatten out and have like a prostrate habit if you pinch, and so we don't recommend pinching. We'll talk about some growth regulator applications um, in the finishing environment. You know, we aren't going to talk about the vigorous landscape series today because we're primarily focusing on spreading and compacts, but there is a growth regulator application um, recommendation if it's needed on the spreading series. The compact series, generally, if you've made that application in the propagation environment and you're growing with bright light, um, you know, moderate fertility and good moisture management, it shouldn't be necessary to apply growth regulators in the finishing environment. We do like to see, especially on the compact orange, stay away from growth regulating on the compact orange altogether. The spreading series, generally no additional growth regulating should be needed either if you're you know, watching your cultures carefully. But if it's needed, we have found that a 0 0.2 parts per million uh, bonsai as a drench is very uh, appropriate and would keep that growth nice and toned and it doesn't delay flowering or reduce flower size or anything like that. And again, as Jack said, you know, if you're concerned about that rate being too high in your northern location, you could back that off to 0 0.1 part per million, which is a very low rate. And as I said, highlight moderate fertility and even soil moisture combined with good spacing should reduce the need for growth regulating. In terms of spacing, you know, we've talked a lot about spacing being really important today and preventing stretch and promoting good architecture and flowering. These are just some kind of guidelines to go by for the quartz. We like to see 10-inch centers. For the 6-inch in gallons, 12-inch centers. For the 8-inch containers or hanging baskets, 14-inch centers. Uh, for the 10-inch, we would recommend 16-inch centers, and then we don't have a recommend, we don't have it on the slide here, but you can even do these in like 12-inch hanging baskets, and at that point, 20-inch centers, 18 to 20-inch centers would be appropriate. In terms of scheduling, you can see that we recommend 10 weeks from stick to finish on all the container sizes except for the hanging basket where you're only using one cutting per pot. And if you are propagating in traditional cells, we would recommend adding about one week to that production time just so that you allow for that time when those roots are kind of establishing in the container. And on the hanging baskets, um, you know, you have the opportunity to go with one plant per pot or three plant per pot. If you go with one plant per pot, we do recommend adding two weeks to the schedule. Um, but it really does give the grower the opportunity to think about the economics here and your initial input costs, but maybe a couple more weeks on the bench. Um, you know, so there's some good options here. I'm going to show a picture in another couple slides, too, where it's one plant per pot versus three plants per pot. And what we would also want to think about here is consumer performance. Uh, generally, one plant per pot is probably going to perform longer for the consumer and be easier for the consumer to maintain than those three plants per pot. Three plants per pot will probably outgrow that container rather quickly. Uh, variety specifics, just a couple things to point out here. As I mentioned, the compact orange is very sensitive to PGRs, and we would, after propagation, there, don't use any kind of growth regulators on the compact orange. And then compact blush pink, all the pictures that you've seen today, do show sort of a two-toned pink effect under high light. So, you know, generally for the consumer, and once you get out into the field environment or the garden environment, it's going to be more of a light pink and not two-toned. Now this is the image that I was talking about here. This is the Sherritt Pack Trials. And the picture to the left is three plants per pot versus one plant per pot to the right. And you know you can see how those three plants per pot are probably going to outgrow that hanging basket rather quickly and be hard for the consumer to maintain. Uh, we do recognize that some of you will probably be selling to landscapers. And so we do have some recommendations for spacing in the landscape. Um, we recommend three to five plants per square yard. And the five plants per square yard, the four and five plants per square yard, would be appropriate for the compacts and the spreading types. And you can see that that's at 18 and 16 inch centers. It is important to acclimate them for one week to 5,000 foot candles before they go outside. And I think in terms of acclimation, we would also want to be talking about moisture management, not just to control uh, growth, but also to just kind of tone those plants and get them ready for that garden environment. So brighter light and less water before they go out, and that will get them, help get them acclimated for the outdoor environment. Transplant shock can be noticeable, especially if temperatures are cool. So you may notice a slight wilt on those plants for a few days, but generally they come out of it and there's no long-term effects. Okay, do I have any questions? I'm going to look through questions here. Jack, do you have any additional comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll give a few comments here while you're checking the question side of things. 
you know, Rebecca has focused a lot about the importance of how much moisture is used with the crop. It's easy to equate these to what you know with geraniums as well, that these are plants that will take as much water as you give them or as little water as you give them. Um, so you really are in control of what you're going to do with that plant and how you're going to develop it. The reason that we did these water trials here was to look to see how far could we push that, knowing that, yes, you get a bigger, more expanded leaves the more water you give them, but then at the time that it goes out to the garden, the transplant shock and all those factors is a little tougher. So keeping them dry throughout is a great way not only to hold the height, avoid stretch, kind of maintain the plant, but also to prevent getting such lush foliage um, that, you know, again, it takes advantage of all the space, which is so important in your conditions. So, you know, play with the watering. If you've toned it and hardened it down a little bit before it goes out, it's going to then acclimate faster, settle in, and pick up and start growing in the landscape quite appropriately. The other comment is, again, temperatures. And if you look at the, the uh, schedules that have been shown, all that information, there's parts there in Canada where you're going to be dealing with cool temperatures quite late into the spring. And so, again, this is a crop you might want to actually schedule to be coming in just, you know, as it's starting to warm up. So especially going outside, if that ground is cool and moist, you'll want to be sure people understand that they should probably keep the plants in the pots until things start to warm up a little bit, then transplant into the ground. Because once those plants go in that cold, wet ground, those roots aren't going to be too active. You're going to see a little bit of wilting. And the natural reaction is to water. If you keep watering, you might you know, cause root rot and other problems. So really work on the water management of this crop uh, to get it prepared to go out and to get it the best start off once it does get out there. Um, okay, I've got a question here that's come out about uh, performance in the shade or part shade. Jack, what what have you seen when you're out there uh, seeing sun patients in the landscape in terms of sun patients in the shade? Shade, yeah. You know, again, the beauty of this plant is that under full sun conditions, it, it works so well and gives such a good show. Is it a plant that will do okay under shady conditions? Absolutely. Um, and patients will do that. But just as you would, would expect with any of them, in a shady garden location, it is then going to stretch a lot more. And as we look at the architecture of the plant, this, you know, with the New Guineas, the, all the branches tend to be very upright, and so the flowers are all held up at the top. With the Sun Patients, it has a, a much stronger, more open architecture to it. So if it's going to stretch up, there's now going to be more gapping between each of the flowers. And so it will look like not as much flower, and you'll have bigger, kind of softer plants they'll still get great garden performance out of it. There's no doubt about it. But if they want an impatience for the shade, there's plenty of those on the market. I think, you know, really critical to this, and, and we'll get into this a little bit as we talk about the, the program, getting the message across to the consumers that this is a plant that can take full sun conditions, get it out, and use it in a way that they may not be always comfortable or used to using impatience uh, is where they're really going to get the value out of it. And making sure that message is out there is really important. We'll talk about that as we talk about POP and tags and the information available to support the program. Okay, how about the differences in scheduling, uh, say for example, like a 10-inch New Guinea hanging basket versus a Sun Patients hanging basket? We talked about only 10 weeks on the Sun Patients. Um, what would we typically expect for scheduling on a New Guinea patient basket in Canada? And you know, how many cuttings per pot are they traditionally using? Mm -hmm. If we let's use our Ultra New Guinea program as as a counterpoint to what we're talking about with the Sun Patients, we know that in in the varieties used in the Ultra program, from unrooted cutting to flower, we can get that down to about 12 weeks, and so that's considering all the temperatures, all the conditions are going just as scheduled, and the growers have helped manage that properly. So in a 10-inch basket, where a grower would be using three cuttings you know, we're looking at a 12-week from unrooted cutting to finished stage where it can go to the retail. Again, with the sun patient, even if you're using one cutting, you know, we've indicated that that could be up to 12 weeks. Well, you're using then the same amount of time, but only one cutting as opposed to using three cuttings in that pot. Again, different than the New Guineas because of the structure of the plant, where the New Guineas with three cuttings are all going to have those flowers up at the top, kind of the the old pot mum look where it's just a nice full uh, coverage of flowers at the top, one cutting in that pot is going to make it a little bit more open. So 
it will seem like it's less flower, more foliage. But the architecture and shape of that plant, that basket should be really nice with the one cutting. And again, at that point, it's still got enough flowers to go out to the retail. And then once that goes out to the consumer location, it will just continue to fill in and grow and look really nice. Longevity of that, as you've already pointed out, Rebecca, will be better and easier to maintain because of one cutting in a pot. I would clearly say right now, if you're thinking about putting three cuttings in a 10-inch basket, although as cutting suppliers we'd love to sell you that, that's crazy. You can do this crop with one cutting in a 10-inch basket without any problem. Same amount of time as what you're used to with the New Guineas. Yeah, Jack, I think one important point to make, too, about, you know, differences between the New Guineas and timing and the sun patients is, you know, the example Jack used with our ultra program and 12 weeks from stick to finish on an ultra New Guinea patient, that's at 75 degrees average daily temperature, yeah. um, that 12 weeks. And so, you know, we're talking 80 degree days and 70 degree nights or, you know, and which is very warm and unrealistic for most growers to try to get a New Guinea crop to finish during that time just because of the cost for heating especially for you growers in the north. And you can still see that 12-week finish on a sun patient crop at cooler temperatures. So big difference there. Yeah, and, and Rebecca, you know, most of the growers there are dealing with that by hanging the New Guineas up. So yeah. you're getting more heat up in the top of the greenhouse. There's no reason why you can't do that with the sun patient. It just shows that then at the time that it goes out, that warmer temperature and those conditions will push them faster um, it's a good thing they'll be hanging up with lots of space between them. They'll need it for the, the spacing of the plants. Um, and they'll have a little bit more flower then to go out. So you might, even if you hang them up, be able to get them out quicker than the 12 weeks. Okay, it looks like we've covered all the questions with that. I'm going to turn it over to Jack, and he's going to walk us through some program specifics about sun patients, and then we'll jump into ultra geraniums. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it was a good lead in we've talked about the culture and your questions were perfect about you know where does this go how do we use it um, this plant again we want to get the message across and make sure that the retailers know what's different about it the consumers know what's different about it um, and so that'll be part of our discussion as we come through here um, at this point what we're looking at is that up until now um, anything that was being grown and worked with was kind of in the trial programs um, and at this stage on out for you growers that are getting ready to go into your spring programming, uh, if these are open to all growers. In the past, the Sun Patients were part of an exclusive program with the Home Depot, and now you know they will continue to sell and show this product with their original brand and logo on it, but um, the Sun Patients are available for everyone to use now, which is great. When we have a good plant like that, it really does kind of make it nice for everyone, the, the market benefits. Prices, um, again, you'll be dealing with that through your broker at JBK. So, um, you know, the prices, though, do include, include everything, which uh, the, the tag, the intellectual property fee, all those, and the freight. So um, whether you're doing unrooted or rooted, if you're doing rooted, that's going to come from one of the rooting stations. Uh, so, again, talk with your JBK rep to get all the pricing and everything necessary on this program. Um, we have mentioned that there are rooting stations. You know, as we look in particular for supply in the Canadian region, one of the primary rooting stations you'll be sourcing from will be Linwell Gardens in Ontario. And so, um, again, look for that. But as you can see here, we have regionally made this available to a range of the different root and cell people that we work with. Um, and if you're buying from any of those people, you can access the product there too. But for Canada, we imagine most of the supply will come through Linwell. We uh, really we love this plant. We want you to grow it. There's a lot of interest in it. Um, and again, that's the reason for doing webinars like this, to talk about what's different about it and help it make it work. We really want you to trial this. And so as you look at um, getting into some patients, if you're still just a little bit unsure, um, not, not totally convinced about how good this plant is, well, there are trials available. And the way these are set up is to be able to give you a small number of plants of all the varieties. So as you see here, you know, seven trays or 100 cuttings each of each of the compact group. Um, there's some with the vigorous and spreading. This way you can get it in, put it through your production, test it and check and see how it's going to perform. 
what is nice is because this plant has been in existence for a few years, we have good production history with it, we have excellent um, field performance with it. Um, if you're needing help getting comfortable with it, then the trials are the best way to go, uh, rather than committing a lot of space and, and time to this project. But we do believe once you've done that, you'll probably start growing a lot more sun patients each year because they are so good. If you are supplying to uh, landscapers, um, this would be an important fact. We do want you to get the uh, license for that. Part of that is because those varieties that are going to be shipped to supply landscapers, you will not want tags because the landscapers don't need a bunch of tags to put out in the landscape. And so to be sure that you've got it properly licensed and can request the cuttings to be shipped at no tag, uh, you do need to get the license taken care of. Uh, to obtain that, you can contact Juliet Hedden here at the Ecke Ranch. Uh, the phone number is listed here, 760-944-4037. Or you can contact her via email at jhedden at eckyranch.com. She can set you up and get that trial license agreement sent out or the landscape agreement sent out uh, so that you can go ahead and get that product and be dealing with the landscapers. Again, it is necessary to identify the orders for that so that you can have them shipped without a tag. Otherwise, tags will come with every cutting. Um, as I've just said, all material that is not for trials or for landscapers must tag, and that's part of the program. Again, the tags are designed to help really get across the message to the consumer that this is a full sun in patients, that it has application unlike what they're used to with the previous generations of plant material coming out. And so that's there. Also, they are making available different um, types of tags, types of labels to work with. Um, there's also POP, another uh, product being developed for the retailers to be able to use. And for any of you that are involved in custom programs, if you are doing a custom branding for a garden center or for your own program, that is possible, but you must get the tags approved. The person at Cicada is Jamie Kitts, who will help you through that process. And um, again, they're being very flexible about the tagging. Um, the requirements are pretty minimal. What has to be on there, the Sun Patients logo must be visible on the tag. That is one of the key, um, key pieces of information that must be on every tag. But you are able to do a custom tag program, and again, contacting uh, Cicada directly is the best way to accomplish that information. That is important, again, because as you place your orders, you need to be working with your rep to be able to show that if it's being shipped, that you have custom tags approved so that tags will not be shipped with it. As I've said, we have some years of history with it. And um, these pictures we threw in here for you to enjoy today, the one on the left, these were plants that were at the JVK office this last um, summer. I took this picture in mid-August. And uh, again, you can see how nice and full and large those plants are. They're in theirs. And then over at Linwell Gardens, they have pots of them outside of their main office. You can see them here. Again, a very, very impressive um, view of what the plants look like. Um, these happen to be in pots, but again, planted in the garden, you can get even more growth and, and fullness out of them because they have a unrestricted access to water when you're doing that. So um, fantastic plant, fantastic performance. We know you're going to be happy with them. If you have um, program-specific questions, and these are our sales-related issues that we've not addressed today, our sales administration um, person here at Ecke Ranch is Eric Ralston. Again, you can see the phone number, 760-944-4087, or again, his email at eralston at eckyranch.com. Um, those questions can be directed to them. I would first suggest that you take your questions to the JVK reps. They should be um, informed on how to answer those questions. And then if not, they can let us know so we can help intervene and help. So we're going to switch gears just a little bit. Um, we've talked about sun patients, and now we're going to talk about ultra geraniums. Um, we, are, we think these, again, are crops that you're going to love, and you're already familiar with so many of our geraniums. but it's a good refresher to talk about that as we're going into the spring programming. Uh, when we use the word ultra, we started this a few years ago because we were being asked by the growers to help take from the range of all of our genetics 
those plants that grew together had similar reaction to growth regulators, um, you know, could help them create bench run programs within the greenhouse, it made it easier for them to select from the multiple numbers of varieties available to come up with a good mix of things that would work effectively in the greenhouse and, and help them go through as quickly and as efficiently as possible. With uh, some other crops, we've even been able to develop out to the BRAC meters and the bud meters and all the different temperature-related um, measurements that you can use to help schedule them. Today, we don't have the geraniums to that level, but again, our, our goals here with the Ultra was to be sure that we were getting matched growth habits so that you had plants that were of similar height and size uh, so that they would finish in good proportion to each other in the greenhouse. A uniform reaction to the culture program so that it take the same fertilizer, pHs, temperatures, light conditions, all those things for uniform growth. A uniform reaction to growth regulator treatments. You heard us talk about that in the sun patients where there are some varieties that are very specifically very sensitive to growth regulators. And within geraniums, that is a reality too. Even if we say it's a series, and this would be true for all of the breeding series out there, um, you will find that there are plants that react very strongly to growth regulators, unlike others in the series. So we've tried to help through this ultra grouping whole plants together that have similar reaction. And it's, again, all geared towards bench run opportunity to help you meet your sales needs uh, in the least amount of time, the most effectively with the least amount of variation in the crop. So when we talk about ultra, that's what we're talking about. And in the geranium programs, we're talking about the Ogilvy geraniums, which are part of the ECI program today. So let's look at a few of this, uh, the specific series. The candy series is our dark leaf series. And, and there's been a lot of talk about how the dark leaves have some real advantages to the other varieties. Those advantages being, number one, as you shift the product, you have less leaf yellowing. So um, from a transportation standpoint, where geraniums are not always that adaptable to being transported because of they'll, their leaves will turn yellow on you. Uh, the, the dark leaf series all tend to be a little bit more resistant of that, and so it makes it easier on the transportation side of that, both from the cuttings coming to you and also from the finished product being shipped. Um, from a heat tolerance standpoint, the dark leaf varieties tend to hold up to higher temperatures in the garden. Uh, Usually we see under high temperatures, the leaves of the geranium start to yellow, especially around the margins. Uh, we can see these plants at very high temperatures still continue to hold their dark green foliage. There's really no negative reaction on them. So it makes a very nice show, even if you're having a very warm summer. The candies are our most compact series of any of the geraniums that we are selling in the zonal types, um, but where they fit very nicely to, for high density four inch type programs and again that compact habit allows that and even more importantly you can do that without any kind of growth regulators on them to hold them down. If we're not having to use growth regulators we're getting nice full foliage, we're getting good branching and we are also getting very nice large flower umbels. Some people would use the FRL type materials to get better um, branch positioning and that's, that's okay Again, that is an early growth regulator on the crop, so if you're going to do that, do it at lower rates and keep it limited to how many applications you put on. You don't want to really delay things out. Um, but again, you can get a nice full branching three to four nice flower umbels coming up on the candies quite easily, again, by using the ultra grouping. These are the varieties that fall within the ultra grouping here for the um, candy series. You see, again, you've got a nice assortment, the white, lavender, violets, salmons, and then into the darker, the, um, the, uh, sorry, the fantasy kiss, cardinal, which is the red. Um, again, this is a nice grouping, so if you're trying to select out of the line those that you can grow in an ultra capacity, this is that, that grouping. This picture is what I took of a, some trials that we were running last year, and, and there are four of the candy varieties in this. And again, it gives you, um, without growth regulator, you can see that they're staying compact and, and full. These are in small orange type pots. You can see that they're starting to throw up flower umbels and flower buds real quickly. Well, excuse me just a minute. Sorry about that noise. Um, 
and then you'll see that the flowering is coming on a little uneven, but in this case, this wasn't an ultra grouping. This just happened to be a, a candy trial, and it did really nicely show how, again, the plant habit stays very tight, compact, and uh, good, easy for this kind of application. The Maestro series is our, our next series as we move up in size. It's the green leaf. It's, so it's Unlike the candies, it's a greener leaf with the zone. Uh, it's our mid-vigor series. I'd like to refer to this. This is more the European-style geranium when we look at it from a height and size. And why, why is that important? Part of that is there's a great amount of flexibility in what this pot can be used for. It can be grown in pots or in baskets because it's not so vigorous that in a basket it will outgrow that basket and get too tall. Um, so this is a good one if you're looking for a very all, you know, all-purpose type of geranium seed, uh, series to work with. Very large flower umbels. You can see, again, the plants on the bench all giving a lot of show and a lot of color. Here, growth regulators are suggested. And again, part of that can be if you're using ethyl, that's, that's a nice application early for nice branching. Uh, the cycocell is generally the growth regulator of choice. Again, just to kind of keep the plants toned coming along and not stretching out too much. So the Maestro series, another option in the series of ultra geraniums to work with. And again, here you see some of the key varieties that fall within this. Again, everything from the bright red through pinks, lavenders, and into the pastel colors, the lavender splash and the white splash, or I'm sorry, lavender parfait. So Maestro, another one of your series options. Um, when we look at all of these, are there any differences in pHs or fertilizations or anything? No. What we see more in, if it's more compact, we've eliminated growth regulators. If it's bigger, you will be using some growth regulators. But fertility, irrigation, all those things are very similar for all the series and very appropriate to any geranium crop. As we move from the, the Maestro series, our largest series are the Patriots, and these are, again, going to be a, a lighter green leaf with the zoning on them. They are our most vigorous series. These are, if you're using large pots, um, these are good for a lot of combination planters where you want the geranium to really stand out. Big, large flower umbels, so it's a lot of show for whether it's in a pot or in a nice garden setting. Again, growth regulators required. That helps, again, just create good branching, full, most compact plant habit around it, so now it really holds up those big flowers. Um, our, the Patriot series is one of our most popular series, and again, there's probably the broadest range of colors available in it uh, to work with, and again, you see kind of the selection there on the bench uh, from our pack trials this past spring. Some of the key varieties in there, the salmon, the pink, the white. Uh, Foxy has been included. It's one of the European collection varieties, but it's one that will match the ultra timing in here very nicely, so it gives you a little bit of additional color range to work with. Um, not as many plants in the ultra series at this point for the geraniums in the Patriot series, uh, but part of our parameters now in breeding and selecting helps us move in that direction. So we should be able to help fill that out faster as we go the next couple of years. From the Patriot series, we did want to move to one other series to talk about. This is one uh, we brought it into the webinar today because it's a series that, um, as, as we would term it, is probably underutilized, but where there's a lot of activity happening with the, um, the series of baskets and landscape geraniums being used, the stardoms are our interspecific series. It's ideal. It does carry more of the foliage and the plant habits similar to zonals, um, and so that is a nice characteristic. It, it's rounding and mounding with the zonal look to it. Um, the flower umbels are smaller than the traditional zonals, um, but there are twice as many. So when you know people are worried about smaller flowers, there's not less color because of the higher flower count. It does mean that these plants are a little more self-cleaning. So if they're in a basket or in a landscape situation with the rain or overhead irrigation, it does clean off real quickly, but it does return flower and color fast to the garden. And um, one of the nice benefits here, using it instead of an ivy, there's no edema to deal with. So stardom series, there's eight colors available in this range. Um, and again, if you're using combinations or baskets or landscape-style geraniums, 
uh, this is clearly a series to look at as one of the options in the ultras as well. At this point, we're going to ask uh, any questions that we can address regarding the geraniums. Just rambling. 